Well, hello, Minders. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. What we're going to do today is uh, playtime. A lot of you have asked would I ever demonstrate yippo, yippo, however you pronounce it. And yes, um, I've intended to do it many times and just not found the right occasion. But today I want to do that. I want to play around with it. And I'm going to do this a little differently than normally the way I review products, which is I'll spend time playing and experimenting. I'll plan out an episode and then I'll share with you what I found, maybe do a demo. Instead, I want you to just come along with me as I do the experimenting and playing around, okay? So uh, it may be a format I do in the future, but sometimes I just want to sit down and play with it and see what will happen and uh, just have you kind of looking over my shoulder. Now, Yupo is a Legion paper. They're the same ones that make Stonehenge Aqua, a very, very fine watercolor paper. Yupo has been around for a while, actually. Uh, it's a polypropylene paper, all plastic. This is their medium weight. Um, uh, they also have a heavy weight. They also have a translucent. Translucent is, it's not as translucent as like, say, tracing paper, but you can more see through it than you can the others. So just for curiosity's sake, there's that and the heavy. This is a piece of the heavy. It's it's just uh, thicker. So we'll just take a look at it and see what we think. Now I've got these out here because I um, kind of do kind of an impromptu comparison. And I want to talk about relatively non-absorbent surfaces. Let me clear this out of the way. Now these are where sort of test play pieces that I did. I actually have a video on this. This is watercolor canvas. This is Hobby Lobby's Master's Touch watercolor canvas. Looks like this. And it is an artist's canvas. It's got the canvas texture. This uh, was a, a sort of a play test piece. I started years ago and I just kind of keep coming back to it, and, to it and fiddling with it and doodling on it. Uh, called Aquaboard. Now what these two have in common um, is that they use an absorbent ground. Absorbent ground is something you can buy. Et voila. This is core. Golden also makes an absorbent ground. Daniel Smith makes an absorbent ground, probably others. It's a gesso-like coating, but in addition to standard gesso, it adds a ground that absorbs watercolor and pigment just a little bit and gives it just enough of that grip and tooth to paint on. So the reason I'm bringing these out is there are characteristics that these, this will share with polypropylene paper, the Yupo. And there is going to be things that are different. And they're both different than standard watercolor paper. And I have a scrap out here uh, just to maybe do some comparison tests as we go along. So I will link to this video and you can go watch it. And I have a lot of number of comments about how this handles. I've never actually used uh, Ampersand's Aquaboard on video. Um, but it's very similar to the canvas. The only thing is, is it has more of a pebbly texture and not a canvas texture. This is actually what I prefer if I'm working on a not on an absorbent ground type of bore. They put these on masonite so they're like a museum panel. They can be framed and mounted in different ways. Now one of the characteristics that these both share is uh, most of the watercolor sits on top. It's, it's called absorbent ground that it's primed with, uh, but it's not highly absorbent. It's nothing like paper. Uh, you get a high lifting quotient. You get much harder edges because there's no dispersion, no diffusion, you know, by the wet paper because this stuff does not absorb water. And you get diminished ability to glaze. That is, do repeated layers. The more paint you add, the more likely you are to lift. However, that's a blessing and a curse because the blessing part is you can go back and do a lot of techniques where you use the lifting to render with and that's what makes it fun i would say that things like by the way pardon this light i get afternoon light and i've tried a number of ways to block it so i'm just going to try to keep it blocked with my body it's as in an advanced material i would say if you're a beginner it's going to frustrate you probably a little bit maybe it won't but if you're a realist and you like more control over the watercolor you're probably going to have a harder time. And the reason I'm talking about these and not the Yupo is I'm making that transition. All the characteristics that this has, um, these have but more. This has no absorbency whatsoever. So unlike the uh, absorbent ground, everything sits on top. 
you're going to have a hard time doing controlled blends. Graduations are going to be very difficult. Most of your washes are going to be a little more edgy. Granularity will show to a great degree on smooth paper like this, and so on and so forth. But you can get some just some fantastically neat expressive techniques. So let's get into this. I'm using my Renaissance paints, continue to experiment with those. We're just going to start out with some basic washes. Let me zoom in a little bit. All right, let's just do a basic flat wash. You know, one of the first things I tell beginners on paper is to just start out with getting nice, clean, evenly painted flat washes. Well, you're in a whole different ball game when you're working with this kind of paper. So flat wash is almost impossible. <laughs> you can see how it pools every streak, every stroke. So right away, you know, and I know this from working on even the canvas, you know you're dealing with something that you have to be more expressive with. I do not have this pre-planned. I mean, this is about as free form as my episodes get. But I've, I've been wanting to play with this for a while and just see, why not do it on camera, right? Just let them pool. Now, it, as you might expect, uh, water sits on top for a long time and this takes a long time to dry. I'm gonna put out that same red over here on this arches. And see, you, you can already see, uh, you know, I get smooth washes on the arches with heart, without even trying hardly. And this just pools and runs and moves forever, seemingly. Let's get something deeper out here. I gotta let this stuff dry. I want several things to dry at once. And that drying time, of course, is going to be even worse if you add the more water you add. I've used Yupo as a uh, palette for watercolor pencils because you can, it has a tiny bit of tooth to it. Water doesn't beat up because of the treated surface. And so you can scribble down pencil and use it like a palette. So I've had that experience with Yupo. And I know that the paper will stain, but you can lift it to a great degree. I'll pull my arches down in here. I've seen some crafters do some amazing stuff with alcohol inks on Yupo. I'm going to add some water over here on the arches. Wick it over. See, so you're getting a backwash there. I don't think you're going to get much of a backwash. Let me see. Well, I guess you do kind of. produces that what do they call that Japanese marbling effect suma something but it quickly goes away if you want it to all right while those are drying let's see what kind of a, a dry wash I can get get as much of the moisture out of my brush as I can a lot less water just streakier I think you're almost better off with more water the dry brush on arches it gives you that effect Gets you nothing on here. Streaks. So you're probably better off with more water. See what I'm talking about too? The hard edge characteristic. Because it, water continually puts, pushes pigment out to the edge and it dries. I'm going to keep turning this around. Kind of settle that to hold it. I kind of have to hold it flat in order to keep it from moving any at all. Alright, so let me dry this and we'll come back and we'll play with the blending and lifting after it's dry. So... You can see how weird it dries, and getting a flat wash is pretty difficult. It t tends to, to dry kind of in, in layers or levels. I suppose I could pick some of that back up before it dries so it smooths out a little easier. And maybe without a hair dryer, it dries a little more evenly. I don't know, these are all questions I have. What I'm really curious about is glazing. I'm going to take that same purple. Now, generally, even with paper, you want the lighter staining colors on the bottom and the darker ones over the top. You see I got lifting there. I, I do have a very wet brush. Yeah, so as expected, glazing would be pretty difficult, but not impossible. And probably you're only going to go one layer before it just turns into a royal mess. And one of the things that, that I think is most exciting about these type of papers is lifting. And you can do a lot of your rendering that way by going in and pulling out highlight. And I'm I'd be interested in anyone's input who's used it a lot, 
and felt like they were successful with it. Down in the comments, those of you who use this uh, regularly and have have managed to do some techniques you're you're happy with, proud of, tell me what you felt was successful. But I can see one thing might be either pencil drawing or ink drawings, uh, where that carries most of the value, and then doing watercolor kind of expressively on top of that, and then going back in and picking up highlights. Let's put some different values of pencil down here. And I know on regular watercolor paper, as long as you're HB or harder, you don't get a lot of graphite traveling with the wash. So I'm hoping that's the same on Yupo. Thinking colored pencil would be a really neat way. Oh yeah, look how colored pencil goes down. Nice. Doesn't feel like there'd be enough tooth, but it really is. That You know, that may be the thing right there. This is the Prismacolor, which is wax based. I'm going to pull out a Polychromos here in a minute and try that too, which that's an oil base. We'll shade it so we got some dark parts and some light parts. Really nice tooth for pencil. That's, that amazes me. What color do have I not used? Let's try an orange. This is Faber Castell Polychromos, an oil based colored pencil. Ooh, nice. See how lightly I can, can go pretty light. That is nice. And my, I'm assuming that none of that will move when I add water. And that's cool because I can keep the washes fairly simple let them be expressive and move around and the rendering, most of the rendering detail will be in the pencil. I've actually seen Yupo pieces that have used ink, done really nice little ink drawings and then gone in with some pretty wild expressive washes. So that's kind of the direction I'm thinking. Bring out this Statler pigment liner. Well, that's not really darker. Here's a Pigma Micron sepia. Here's a Kurataki brush pen. Got something a little darker going on here. Now you have to be careful with ink because sometimes what's permanent on paper is not permanent on a non-absorbent surface. So we'll see what happens. There's a zebra. Both of these are permanent and waterproof on paper, as are the microns. Yeah, before I go washing all of those, ooh, I just wanted to see. See what I mean? That is the uh, zebra pen. Permanent waterproof on paper. Neither one of those are on this. Okay, so this is Future Steve from a day later popping in. I just wanted to pop in at this point and say that all those ink pens that I said were not permanent are permanent. They just needed more drying time. Apparently a lot more drying time. I came back to these a day later and all of those ink pens were not movable with water. So back to the playtime and the demo. See what it does to the graphite. No problem. A little bit of graphite traveling with the wash, not much. That's an HB pencil. No problem with no problem with the pencil, although it does water beads up a little. Let me get a little paint on there. By the way, notice this little beading up here? That's a fingerprint. And this is one thing you have to be careful with. I noticed it down over here somewhere. Uh, the oils from your finger will affect the surface of this. So you might either want to handle it with gloves or make sure you handle it by the edge. But that is my fingerprint right there. All right, so I'm dry now. And it occurred, a couple things occurred to me while I was waiting for that to dry. <clears throat> Number one, I switched to a brush that doesn't hold as much water as a black velvet, which is great for uh, watercolor paper, but I'm thinking not so much for this. So this is a Da Vinci Cosmotop Spin, it's a synthetic, and uh, they typically hold less water. And sure enough, I'm getting 
uh, more pigment in the brush and less water so I'm getting a smoother wash so that's a discovery also uh, the media that I applied over did not disturb as I expected um, you know here's the uh, graphite I can lift back down to it and you can see it so possibly it could do some shading some maybe even some intricate shading in pencil or in colored pencil here lift down here and we'll see the, the prismacolor it's all intact the polychromos this is the neat thing too as I mean you can just lift all this right back up but I don't want to lie to you uh, Upo is hard to use it's difficult so it, it really this is just like any other medium and especially like watercolor is you you got to spend some time understanding understanding what works what doesn't and you can't fight it I talk about this a lot with regular watercolor and it's, it's going to be true with Upo you can't fight what that paper is it is a hard non-absorbent paper and it's always going to be that way but it also occurred to me that all of these media these dry media and the ink media could be put down last on top and i think i've actually seen some like that now you probably your eye went over here and saw these i'm thinking that yupo might be the perfect medium to break out these watercolor markers windsor newton watercolor markers Because you have a lot more control about where the color goes and how it spreads. Probably is going to dry pretty quick. I don't use these very often. I have a few times. Not because there's anything wrong with them, but just because markers... I've had a hard time working into my workflow, figuring out how I might use them. I'm seeing some possibilities here. Anyway, I'm going to have these on standby in case I want to do any further use of those. All of this up here needs to dry again. So while that's happening, pull out one of these ink pens again. And if this is going to be on top, you're not going to add any more paint or water. Again, this is my Zebra Fude Sign brush pen. So let's bring in this Prismacolor pencil. And so you can do some shading right on top of that watercolor. Maybe some defining of forms, perhaps. Yeah, so I mean, you can come back on top with any of those mediums. This again is the Winsor Newton watercolor marker. This is the bullet. So this would allow you to draw some. Maybe put down some color in hatching. I don't know. And if I kept my brush just damp, it would actually control it more. And the more drier I get this brush, more blending control I'm having. Yeah, so it doesn't take much to of a damp brush to lift. Put some water spots on there. I bet that's going to be interesting. You can see that where the water spots, even after it's dry, create some uh, little texture lifting areas without even putting a brush on there. Well, you know what? I'm anxious to try a little doodle, a little landscape doodle, one of my spontaneous doodles, and we'll see what we can come up with. This will be fun. All right, so let's get started. I've taped my Yupo down to a board. And we're just going to do something spontaneous here, kind of a limited palette. I'm using Renaissance paints. I'm going to start out with some orange ochre. I'll maybe do some browns and purples. And I'm going to get some water involved here. Let's see what develops. I'm on an incline, but I'm tilting this back so it's more level at the moment. This is some Indanthron Blue. It's cool looking. I don't know what it is, but it's cool looking. I dried my brush out a little. By the way, just curiosity. <laughs> this is my the oldest brush that I still use. I'm still using today. I've had this at least 35 years old Winsor Newton uh, it's one of the old type of synthetics but it's always worked really well I don't know 
really what I'm doing. I'm just trying different things and seeing what different brush strokes do. I'm trying to get this paint to make some rounded forms that might look a little like foliage. Just trying, I'm going to pick up some of this excess water here where it's going to take a year to dry. I found that when I was using the uh, hair dryer to dry, it dries I think in a little more unusual patterns. So I can keep this these pools of water more even. Maybe I'll get a smoother blend. But in the end, I, I'm going to take whatever I get. Perhaps I can get some foliage shapes there. I don't know. Probably has to be drier to do that. But that's alright. I don't mind if, if for now these just sort of mingle and meld. Making some real interesting sort of marbly looking shapes. So I'm, I'm rinsing my brush out. I'm drying it off for the most part. It's still damp, but it's probably drier than the paper. So whatever I put down here is going to pick up. Yep, see? It's interesting how much granulation I'm getting up here in this. That's, uh, what is that? Manganese violet? Yeah. Manganese violet does, from Renaissance, it does granulate quite a bit. Alright, I'm going to let that dry, just like that. And I will see what I can do with it. I wanted to just show you something else I'm trying here. I'm, I'm tilting it backwards and letting some of those puddles run back in. And so maybe that's going to create some vertical patterns that will make it very kind of woodsy, foresty. I already like that. That is just awesome. It's running less and less. It's flowing less and less. Okay, we'll continue letting that dry. Okay, what I've started to do is experiment a little bit. Um, just trying to see how much I, uh, pigment, dry brush pigment I can get away with applying to the paper and turning some of these uh, shapes into something a little more definite and not a whole lot not a whole lot of brushing can you do and I'm experimenting with different things like maybe patting it down wherever you put anything any amount of water it lifts what was underneath so I'm, I'm loosening up some of that and just sort of patting it down and I wonder what That'll do anything. Maybe that would blend it together a little bit. It does blend it a little bit. Wow, I mean this is like a totally different way of painting. Just completely different. I could see this working better maybe with acrylics. I did a little experiment here. I'm going to try more of that. I'm, what I'm doing is I'm pushing pigment into the center so that it can create sort of a dark ridge here which would be like a tree trunk and as I push in it creates some boughs maybe I don't know yeah I mean that looks like a tree I just have to keep it very loose that's interesting there where I just did that little bit of spray and you get the spatter let's do some more of this here since that seems to be working make a, a big pine tree big old happy tree right there and boy I tell you talk about possibility of overworking it sure is existing here I wanted to see what would happen in this light blue area with a with a marker it allows me to get a little more paint on the paper without disturbing what's under Problem is, is that's just way too intense for a distant tree. If I try to blend that out, I'm just going to lift it. But maybe I can. That's not bad. I want to see if I can do this without any pencil or pen on top. I want to see how much of this uh, I can get the painting to paint itself. This here looks like it could be a waterfall. 
So let's begin to, like, we got a pool of water up here. Maybe it's catching a hot reflection. That's what it looks like to me. Maybe another pool down here. It's spilling off in different directions. Just kind of go with, with what uh, highlights are already there. Don't recommend UPO for a beginner, I'll tell you that. This stuff is hard to paint on, hard to paint on. And you know, you can lift pigment, like I did up here, you can lift pigment, uh, but you can push it. Push it in directions, which is kind of what I'm doing. Pushing it out of the way, I'm trying to push it into a direction where it makes sense. Like I need a, a kind of a dark edge there. So I just put my hand down in that wet part. <laughs> okay. You're seeing this unfiltered, folks. Totally unfiltered. It's looking a little bit stark. A little bit stark in there. You see that area right there? That's already looking overworked. It's not as fresh as it was. So what I'm trying to do is just figure out ways to keep what's there the interesting patterns and flows and just enhance it a bit basically trying to too hard to control something that's very difficult to control so maybe if I lay in maybe if I lay in some of these brush strokes a little less strokey and a little more organically That's an interesting swirl there, isn't it? Might be able to pull some branches off of that. I don't have a very fine point on this brush though. Let me come back to that in a minute with a rigger. Add some trees there. On the lifting there's just uh, and manipulating of the pigment there's just very little middle ground. It's like either paint or it's white. You know, so it's such a very stark contrast. I'll pop in some water here. See if I can get it to do some things organically. I thought maybe I'd pull out a little highlight there just to give it some definition, but it's again it's it's not subtle. It's like it's either white or it's pigment. It's looking a little more like a landscape. Let's see if I can uh, make some distinct tree impressions over here. Again, all I'm doing is loosening that paint into sort of a a bow, a horizontal bow, like you would see on a fir tree or pine tree, and I'm pushing pigment towards the center because. Fir trees are darker at the center. That's not bad. It's kind of that's kind of saying forest right there. And it's interesting because where I went in and laid my brush and and these start to meld together, it's doing some neat things. It's pushing pigment out to the edge, and I'm getting kind of these stylized little rocky shapes. It's going to be very impressionistic, but I kind of figured that going in. And I like that water spot stuff right there so much, I think I may do more of it. Let's see what happens. I'm going to use the bigger spray bottle though. See what happens there. I'm going to put spots everywhere. But a lot of it right there. I got a lot of kind of lifting going on there with the spots. And some of these wet areas, now that that's been sprayed, are starting to meld together. It looks like I may need to go back in here. I didn't expect to get spots all the way up in here, so that was not intended. 
But happy accidents. Let's get this the water spots are giving a texture, kind of a granular texture to everything. Let me pat some of this, see if I can get that to close in. By the way, a lot of these same techniques you can use on paper um, that I'm using, but you'll get a lot you'll have a lot more control. So I'm hoping maybe my talking my way through this gives you ideas for painting on regular paper. You brave souls out there that want to try this, good luck. Just expect it to be expressive and impressionistic and try to let it do its thing. Try not to over manipulate. I mean look at these little rivers here. That is cool. I didn't expect that. That is cool and that looks organic enough to just leave it like that. Neat. Neat. Now see, those kind of happy accidents are worth it. I'm going to try to give some dark edges down here to this land. Got a nice little cascade, almost a hill, rock fall kind of a thing going on there. Uh, so many of these little wet spots in river. I was just really loving that little rivery look there. It's like there's little craggy... I'm afraid to touch it. Makes me want to shade in around it, make it stand out, but I'll lose the subtlety if I do that. That, that little, that's just, it looks like a tree right there, kind of a craggy. Can you, I hope that shows on video. And it's, these little rivers come down here, it looks like little roots growing in and around the rocks. Man, that's just exciting. I didn't paint that. I didn't, look, here it is again, right here. So cool. All right, I'm going to let this dry because of these exciting things going on. And I'm going to see how I can just very gingerly coax those shapes and those areas along. It's looking very interesting now. And I'm going to probably leave a lot of this out here impressionistic and focus my control in here. But I don't need much more of it. Don't need much more of it. I may bring in a colored pencil. So let me let this dry. We'll come back. Okay, I zoomed in on it a little bit. I wanted to, you to see more closely what's happened here. And all these little rivers that form naturally. Over here they actually look like, like trees or roots or something. I think it looks cool. And here, it looks like more water. Kind of flowing down as a, a waterfall. So, I've got this. Uh, I'm going to try doing some touch up with this purple Windsor Newton marker and I'm just touching up these these tree trunks kind of dark I, I might be able to lighten them a little bit with some water so I'm also going to pick up with the with the very driest brush only enough to pick up a little bit of paint for instance, I could pick up this paint here or, or it's dried on my palette. So I have a very dry brush. And you just... I'm trying to do a shade without disturbing the underlying layer. I mean, glazing is almost impossible. But I can do just a bit of shading. Now these shapes here look like they could be rocks. You see how if I if I put any pressure at all, it loosens the paint up. I mean, my brush couldn't get any drier, or it wouldn't pick up any paint at all. Let's see what happens when I'm going to take this uh, raw umber. It's not really the color I want, but at least with a marker. I'll tell you what, instead of that, I'm going to try sepia. a little bit too dark but let's see 
but I can if I can do anything to it without lifting it off completely yeah I can move it just a tad so I've got some semblance of rocks there again I'm, I'm adding some dry brush shading here and if you if you put down the paint which has any moisture in it at all if you go back over it again you'll lift it so yeah it kind of has to go down and leave it the over lighter areas like this it's a little it's a little better I got a cloth here to try drying my brush out even more so essentially I'm just rubbing pigment off the tip of that brush and that gives me a little bit a very little bit a little bit of control and see if I could if I hit that even one more time it picks it lifts Yep, oh, well, really, I don't think was meant for this kind of, this level of control, even. Yuppo, Yupo. I actually think it's Yupo, but I'm not sure. It's real tempting. It's real tempting to get out my colored pencils and start doing this. Oh, you know what? Oh, I know what I want to try. So I know what color pencil would work. In my tests, you know, I can go back on top of that, and I can fill in, I can do some shading. But I don't want to do that yet. I want to see how much of this I can do with watercolor. Now you know what else is watercolor? Wash. So let's see what that does. Wash is more, is thicker, or it can be thicker, and more viscous. So let's try that. And it doesn't move and flow like watercolor does. And let's see how much. Oh yeah. That's probably the ticket right there. Just want to render some of these. And even gouache, if I rub too much. Yeah, the thicker you get, and that's a little bit dark there, but the thicker uh, I get this, the more manageable it is. No, at this point I could stop anytime. Being the chronic experimenter that I am. And see I've got I am see how much I'm drying this my brush my brush is just super super dry. But the problem is there is then I uh, if there's any moisture on the paper it, it starts picking up the surface. However if I go over to a dry area Dry brush works much better because there's no moisture on the paper. So basically I have to let that area dry and come back to it. It's your typical type of dry brushing shading where you turn, you're turning your brush into almost a pencil. This is kind of neat. I think this looks kind of like a, some dead tree leftover, you know, remnants of old white dead tree so all I'm doing is shading around that a little bit to accentuate it but essentially the water painted that <laughs> yeah it really works best when the surface is dry and if I were now I've dabbed in little uh, under shadows in these areas to make them look like rocks but if I if I keep dabbing in that area it just picks it right back up to white a lot of you may be saying, including me, well, what are the strengths? Because I'm not seeing a whole lot of strengths. Well, the strengths are this expressiveness. I mean, the way all of this here looks, man, I mean, it's just so organic. Kind of make that look like the base of a waterfall. And make, make that look like it's flattening out into a pool. Waterfalls are always lighter at the top where they're cresting over. And then as the water breaks up and hit towards the bottom it's darker so just a few little key details for the eye just to tell the eye what you're looking at and then the rest can be left very expressive well I could probably go on all evening and play with this I think for this video I'm gonna leave it here all right minders this is Future Steve again. After a full night of a little bit further playing and tweaking, uh, I think this is done, and I thoroughly enjoyed this. Learned a lot. Thought of a ton of other techniques I'd like to try. 
And so maybe we'll be doing a UPO episode in the future. Thank you for watching, everyone. Thank you, patrons, for sponsoring this channel and making this content possible. And I hope we'll see everyone in the next episode. Bye-bye.